Welcome everyone to lecture number four for Between War and Peace. In last week's lecture, we explored economic sanctions and arms embargoes. We considered the various deontological and instrumental problems with economic sanctions and the arguments for and against arms embargoes. Last week then we explored economic sanctions. So this week we're going to turn to what might be viewed as political sanctions. And more broadly, we're going to be focusing on the ethics of diplomacy. As you'll see, I've dressed up for today, a bit bored, we're self-isolating at home, so I thought I'd put on the suit, try and get in the spirit of being diplomatic, looking like a diplomat. What we're going to focus on today are the case for various diplomatic measures, such as naming and shaming, ne negotiation, the cutting of diplomatic ties. In doing so, we're going to look at whether it matters that some forms of diplomacy, and in particular naming and shaming, might be hypocritical. Diplomacy is widely cited in the discussions of last resort in just war theory and RTP as one of the most desirable options and the option that should be pursued first. But they don't tend to explore what diplomacy would or should involve, so let's have a look. Let's start with naming and shaming or diplomatic criticism. Is it okay, for instance, for the UK to criticize China for its human rec rights record, given the UK's own problems in terms of its treatment of asylum seekers, the denial of voters to prisoner, votes to prisoners, and the Windrush scandal where it deported its own citizens? Or are states morally required to criticize other states who violate human rights abuses even if they have abused human rights themselves. On the other hand, should they stay silent? Should they only criticize when they've got a strong human rights record? South Africa has repeatedly failed to criticize various states in Africa for human rights abuses, such as Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe. In 2013, Australia very famously fail to criticize Sri Lanka um, for very serious human rights abuses in its war against the Tamil Tigers. The UK under Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s didn't criticize General Pinochet's uh, human rights violating regime in Chile where thousands were um, extra uh, thousands were persecuted and killed. In August 2014, Ed Miliband, the leader of the Labour Party then, criticised David Cameron for his inexplicable silence on the killing of hundreds of innocent Palestinians caused by Israel's military action in Gaza. And more recently, the case you're probably more familiar with, the UK has done very little to criticise Saudi human rights abuses and has failed to hold Hungary to account for its clampdown on human rights under the Orban regime. Under the Trump administration, according to John Bolton in his book, John Bolton, the former US national security advisor, remember, Trump not only failed to criticize the re-education camps of the Uyghur Muslims, he told the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, that it was the right thing to do. So in all these cases, is it okay to stay silent? Are states indeed required to stay silent if they're going to be hypocritical? Or are they obliged to criticize? Now, naming and shaming or diplomatic criticism can be carried out by leaders, diplomats, or other politicians, or more generally NGOs and other influential groups. They can do so in their public statements, in official bodies such as the UN, or in print media or online. What's important is it that it is public. It isn't behind closed doors, like lots of diplomacy. You need to make, for it to be naming and shaming or international criticism, there needs to be a clear statement that someone is doing something wrong. Now, to help to get to grips with this issue, I'm going to first run through the potential reasons for engaging in diplomatic criticism we'll spend the first half of the lecture looking at these, 
And then in the second half of the lecture, we're going to explore some of the criticisms and some of the other forms of diplomatic action. The first reason, pretty straightforward. Although the effectiveness of diplomatic criticism is often understated, one might think that naming and shaming can often be effective at addressing the situation. This is because, the reasoning goes, people try to avoid criticism. But why do we care about being criticised? We can turn to the philosopher R.J. Wallace, who argues more fundamental, most fundamentally that we are social creatures and it matters to us deeply whether we are thought well by our peers. I've got an example to help illustrate this point. Imagine at some point in the future, post lockdown, you're in the pub. You haven't bought a round yet, despite your friends all buying a drink. When it's your turn, you sneak out to the toilet. When you get back, one of your friends notices what you've done and calls you out for being tight. So you don't really like this much. You feel hurt, excluded from your friends. So next time situation occurs, you go straight up and buy a round of drinks. Next time you're in the pub, you get the round in first time. Now the point of this example is that we all like to be seen well by our peers and don't like being criticized. We don't like a pribrium. Now this is pretty straightforward, but let me flesh this out in terms of constructivist international relations theory. In today's lecture, we're going to look at some constructivist arguments for naming and shaming for diplomatic criticism. Some of you may have come across constructivism before, some of you may not. So I'm going to start and try and explain it clearly. For those of you that don't know, constructivism Constructivism is one of the leading approaches to the study of international relations, to the study of IR. It differs somewhat from realism and somewhat from liberalism in that it emphasizes much more the importance of norms. Norms, constructivists argue, matter. What are norms? Norms are appropriate standards of behavior. They're the standards expected of you in society. In the pub, the appropriate standard of behavior between your friends will be to buy a round. In the international system, the appropriate standards of behavior are several. The norms, there are lots of them. These include those that we've already encountered in the module, such as, the norms around sovereignty is responsibility, not to commit mass atrocities against your populations. Norms that we looked at when we looked at just war theory, to not intentionally target other civilians. Other norms beyond what we've already looked at include not to manufacture and to spread nuclear weapons, not to invade other countries unjustifiably, so on and so forth. So there are lots of norms in the international system. Now, according to constructivists, and this is important to emphasize, norms are not the only thing that matter. They say that states also concern about their material self-interest. And this is understood in terms of the pursuit of power or security or economic wealth. Constructivists aren't claiming that these things don't matter. What they're claiming instead is that norms also matter. They're also important and influence how states behave the way that they do. So for constructivists, we need to look not simply to material concerns of states, but also what are called the ideational ones, the ideas, the norms. Why do they argue this? Why is this? Crucial constructivists argue 
It's the notion of legitimacy. States want to be seen as behaving legitimately. Another way of putting this is that they want to be seen as having a good reputation. If you'd like, they want to be seen as good international citizens, part of the respectable world. Now, what is viewed as legitimate behaviour is determined by how others perceive states should be acting. In other words, it depends on the norms. And these aren't preordained, these aren't set in stone. They are simply to reiterate the expected standards of behaviour of the international society at the time. Okay, to make this a bit clearer, let's go back to the pub analogy. You want to be seen as acting legitimately amongst your friends. This is why you will buy around next time. And what is viewed as legitimate isn't somehow preordained. There aren't objective rules about the pub. Rather, it depends on your group of friends. So some groups might not have round buying as a norm, but other groups will. Let me introduce some terminology here to help. The first is the logic of consequences. This says that states follow the logic of maximizing their fixed interests and their preferences. They care about trying to increase their power, understood militarily, care about increasing their economic wealth. This is what realists really emphasize. The second is the logic of appropriateness. This says that states follow the logic of what is deemed to be appropriate in the international system. States try to conform to the expected behavior determined by the prevailing norms of the international system. And this is what constructivists emphasize. On constructivist accounts of IR then, states are concerned not simply with the logic of consequences, although they do think that matters, but also with the logic of appropriateness. What is appropriate? This is another way of saying that states care about legitimacy, their reputation, and not simply whether they increase in material and economic power. Why do constructivists think that legitimacy, reputations matter, and states are concerned with the logic of appropriateness? First, they argue that it matters because of states' enlightened self-interest. So states that have got good reputations are more likely, for instance, to win seats on international bodies. Every year, or depending on the system, every other year or every few years, there are elections to decide who's going to be elected onto bodies such as the UN Security Council, the Human Rights Council, other international organizations as well. If you don't have a good reputation, you're not gonna find it that easy to win a seat. But if you're a country with a strong international reputation, say Norway, Costa Rica, you're often more likely to get international support to get onto these main bodies that carry significant influence. States also need to have good reputations to secure trade deals. They will sometimes struggle to secure trade deals with other states if they've got a bad one, since the other state might be under domestic pressure not to trade with them. States also concerned about being legitimate for their own self-identity. So in the UK, for instance, we've historically um, been proud of our democracy and historically our human rights record, a human rights record state, a liberal state. And we don't like it if we are criticized on these grounds. The same, of course, is true of other states. They don't like being criticized on these grounds. 
So it's part of national identity of states to be viewed as upstanding members of the international community. Now, so far I focused on the state as a whole. But imagine what it's like to be an individual leader, a politician or a diplomat. Leaders and politicians often get together and talk. Diplomats have communities. International politics isn't simply about these in, in the interaction between abstract things called states. It occurs at the individual level, between individuals. In terms of diplomacy, a lot of diplomatic work goes on in New York and in Geneva. At the individual level, politicians and diplomats don't like to feel ostracized, made to sit into the naughty corner, excluded from events in Geneva and New York. And they often want to be seen to be doing the right thing. This isn't simply because they want electoral domestic success and trade deals and seats on international bodies, but because they, or at least some of them, are people who care about their reputations during office and afterwards. So, on the individual level, politicians and diplomats also care about their image, their international legitimacy. So why does it matter then if states are criticised? When states are criticised, challenge are opposed to their reputations and their international standing. If the criticism is widely upheld, the subsequent loss of legitimacy might be significant for the state's interests. For instance, it might be barred from membership of international bodies and lose, tra lose trade agreements. It might also be harmful to its self-identity. Its view of itself as a force for good in the international system is challenged. States then will sometimes want to be keen to address the situation at hand in response to diplomatic criticism or the threat of it. They care about the loss of legitimacy. They want to avoid the opprobrium. Now the potential impact of such criticism is missed on materialist accounts of IR, on traditionalist realist accounts that focus only on material interests and only on enforcement through economic or military measures. Now let's look at some responses and some of these were probably occurring to you already. First response, surely some states aren't really concerned about their reputations. They may be international pariahs already, or they may have powerful friends. They might be Russia or the Trump administration or Assad. Now constructivists accept that some states won't be influenced by criticism because they are more concerned about material power. Or it might be that they don't care about international legitimacy, but rather their legitimacy amongst the smaller group, such as their allies. Syria cares about Russian views, for instance. Israel cares about the, uh, views from the US. Support from allies can be very important for material reasons in helping them not to be subject to, say, a UN Security Council resolution or regional sanctions. And they can also be important for helping them to provide someone to help put forward their view of the world, to help defend them and help defend their claims that they make in response to particular situations and issues. Notwithstanding, despite the fact that some states aren't so concerned, constructivists do claim that reputational pressures influence certain states' behaviour. Here's an example. In Morocco, in the early 1990s, the king denied the validity of human rights and denied that human rights violations were occurring in Morocco. 
In response, there is a series of international and domestic pressures from human rights campaigners. As a result, the King dropped the previously nationalist opposition to human rights and instead starting to see Morocco as belonging to the rights respecting international community. It accepted that violations were occurring within its borders, made changes to its laws, and it generally improved compliance with human rights, although there is still some way to go yet. Okay, this brings us to the second query. You still might think that it's unlikely that those who are committing mass atrocities or serious external aggression will stop their complaints, will stop their attacks simply by others criticizing them, naming and shaming them. They're not going to react to their victims doing so. Alternatively, they're not going to respond to the criticisms of those in the West, which they will just dismiss as Western imperialism. But the point of such criticism might not be to persuade the aggressor to stop what they're doing, rather it's to persuade others who can exert costs on the aggressor. Other states and other actors, such as NGOs, might be more likely to be open to persuasion. Let's go back to the pub analogy. Suppose that you won't buy a round even if a person calls you out on their own even if your friend, that is, criticizes you. They do so when the others are in the toilet and you think you can get away with it because no one else has really noticed. But now suppose that they call you out in front of everyone. They criticize you in front of all the big group of your friends. This really highlights to everyone, firstly, what you have done, but it does more. It says it really emphasizes that there is a system of rounds within your friends and that you are abusing it. And this leads to pressure from them. They see you in a bad light and start to criticize you as well. So naming and shaming in the international system can do something similar. It can draw in others to also understand the situation and to criticize. And in the face of this mounting criticism, they may deny that they are violating human rights and they may change their behavior. So diplomatic criticism seems like it can sometimes work. The critic presents an argument in order to persuade the international community of the wrongness of the violation, as well as to highlight that the norm exists to so the norm about mass atrocity, not committing mass atrocities, they highlight that that exists when they, when they emphasize the violation, and this can lead to the delegitimation of the wrongdoer. Okay, I know that this is a bit theoretical, so let me give you a real world example. UNITA, the Angolan rebel group, shot down the UN plane in early 1999, and was generally in large part responsible for the extremely bloody civil war that ravaged the country for three decades. As a result, the UN imposed sanctions on UNITA, but these sanctions were ignored by several states. Robert Fowler, Canada's ambassador to the United Nations, headed the commission that compiled a report on the events, famously called the Fowler Report. Now, most UN reports, if you've come across any, you find that they're pretty bland, but not this one. It was very critical of sitting African heads of state for violating sanctions. This created a lot of up, up, um, unrest and protest given the UN's normal passivity. But it helped to publicly shame the violators of the Chapter 7 UN Security Council resolution. And the shaming meant that many of the states actually started obeying the sanctions. 
This had the effect of disrupting Unita's supply lines and led ultimately to negotiations and the demilitarization of Unita in 2002. It helped to secure peace in what was one of the bloodiest civil wars over the past 50 years. It's also led to the Kimberley process on the diamond trade, which certifies diamonds to ensure that they are not conflict diamonds. If you've ever bought a diamond, or if you're ever planning on doing so in a few years time, if you might get engaged, for instance, you'll know and you'll, or you'll learn to know that jewelers offer certified diamonds that have gone through this process. So far, we've looked at one reason for diplomatic criticism for naming and shaming. Let's now turn to a second. We focused so far on the short term effects on the immediate crisis. The second reason emphasizes the longer term effects. Last week, when we looked at economic sanctions, we saw one of the reasons for economic sanctions is symbolic. Sanctions can, it's argued, help to express condemnation of a behavior, which can reinforce the sense that it's wrong, which can preclude further incidents of the behavior. Naming and shaming can do something similar. Okay, you might be getting a bit tired of this, but we're going back to the pub analogy again. Suppose that you criticize you, your friends, they criticize you for being tight. They make it clear that there is a norm of buying around in your group when they do so, when they criticize you. This will probably make it much more likely that other friends in the group in the future won't try and sneak off when it's their turn. They won't want to face the criticism. And they will be, it will be very clear to them that it is expected of them that if someone buys them a drink, they will buy one back. It's expected of them to buy rounds. Now, in the international system, by criticizing others, and in particular by publicly criticizing others, states may express their view that there are certain norms in the international system and that these have been violated by the aggressor. This helps to reinforce the claim that the norm against the transgression exists. For instance, in 2013, the US made a very strong rebuke of the use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime in Syria. Obama asserted that their use would cross a red line. This appeared to strengthen and even advance the norm and laws against the use of such weapons. Subsequently, in September 2013, the UN Security Council passed Resolution 2118, which was lauded by the then UN US Secretary of State, John Kerry, as declaring together for the first time that the use of chemical weapons are also a threat to international peace and security. So in this case, the criticism of the use of chemical weapons helped to clarify and further strengthen the view that chemical weapons are inappropriate. I'm now going to turn to the third reason. Third reason for naming and shaming for international criticism. It's widely held that those who engage in terrible wrongdoing should be punished. So Assad, for instance, should be made to bear the costs of his crimes. The leaders of Myanmar should be held accountable for their atrocities against the Rohingya. The international system is, however, fairly devoid of means of punishment. It's very difficult to punish people in the international system. But this doesn't mean that there aren't any systems of punishment available. International criminal tribunals and the International Criminal Court, the ICC, provide a means of punishment for some of those engaged in external aggression and mass atrocities. And we're going to look at these in week seven. 
But as we will see, these have limitations. In particular, it's very difficult to bring a trial against those from the permanent members of the UN Security Council or from those that the UN Security Council wishes to shield. Diplomatic criticism, such as in the form of widespread opprobrium, can punish decision makers since they face reputational loss. The reputational loss that stems from such sanctions might not be all that the leaders deserve. They might deserve, for instance, life imprisonment. Notwithstanding, it seems that such leaders deserve at least criticism, naming and shaming. They deserve at least to be told what they're doing is wrong and to face others to criticize them, to have others criticize them. And the accompanying loss of reputations So think of the huge tarnishing of the reputation of Tony Blair, who before the war in Iraq in 2003 was, had a very po positive um, international reputation and to some extent domestically as well. But in the aftermath of the war on terror and the war in Iraq, he was very, very heavily criticised and on some views is haunted by the criticism that he's received. And this was established by the widespread criticism of their policy, of the policies of Blair and Bush as well. Now, depending on your viewpoint, this might be deserved. That Tony Blair, George Bush deserve to face significant opprobrium on this view as a form of punishment for what they did. Even if leaders might still be subject to other forms of punishment, such as targeted economic sanctions, you might think that leaders deserve this form of reputational loss as well. So we've looked at three reasons for diplomatic criticism for naming and shaming. The first is that it can be efficacious, it can be effective sometimes because it influences states' legitimacy, it challenges their legitimacy, pressurizes them to conform to the norm. The second concerns the longer term effects of diplomatic criticism. It says that by engaging in diplomatic criticism, you're reaffirming the norms that will influence others in the future will encourage them not to violate human rights, not to commit atrocities, engage in aggression. And the third, more straightforwardly says that diplomatic criticism, like any other form of criticism, is something that we don't like and can be seen as a form of punishment, the tarnishing of your reputation. This brings to an end part one of today's lecture. In part two, we're going to turn to the objections to diplomatic criticism and other forms of diplomacy.